All right, so we're going to get started with our next session, um, which is also um, around financial services and banking. So please um, help me welcome Pedro Martinez, who is the business owner for Strong Authentication at Talus. Um, and we're going to be looking at um, just kind of where we're at in terms of authentication for digital banking services and what's ahead. So Pedro. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Well, thanks to all the fantastic job that has been done by the FIDO Alliance over the last almost 10 years, thanks to the fantastic job that has been done by its members committing to the success of, uh, of the technology, I think that if there is one thing that is quite clear right now is that we find ourselves at, uh, at the moment of change. Um, that in a few years, when we will be looking back at uh, 2022, we will uh, certainly see that this was a year, a milestone um, in the world of uh, strong authentication. And when you find yourself in one of these uh, situations, in one of these moments in time, for whatever the, the, the situation, um, best case scenario is that you get to realize that you are in a moment of change but what uh, what is difficult is to uh, be capable of assessing where exactly that moment of change is going to take you exactly in five years in ten years um, or uh, how is it going to take you there how fast is it going to take you there and uh, which uh, which way is going to take you there so because that's difficult to assess. What I would like to propose you today is to take just a walk down memory lane to reflect a little bit about how authentication has evolved <coughs> for um, digital services, and in particular for digital financial services over the years, because hopefully that could give us uh, some hints maybe about how things can be evolving in the, in the future. So, that's, uh, that's what I would like to propose you. And in making such an exercise, looking back, we certainly need to start by the beginning. And the beginning, as for any other digital service, uh, moving back, say, some 30 years ago, um, we find ourselves, like with any other uh, internet service, in a world where services could be accessed um, exclusively through a computer and where the access method was username and password. So that was a situation that from a user experience point of view for what was available at the time was relatively satisfactory. And especially because we didn't have as many uh, services to address, as many password to have to manage. But uh, from, the security, from a security perspective, obviously it was not sustainable and particularly it was not sustainable for, uh, for financial services uh, where you have to protect assets which are very valuable. So that's why very quickly we had to evolve from there and we, uh, we got to a strong customer authentication. We had to move from that single factor of uh, authentication, that knowledge factor, and we needed to incorporate a second factor of authentication. And the second factor of authentication that, um, that we started to use was uh, a, factor of, uh, a factor of possession. So probably among the first uh, um, elements that were used for as a possession factor for, were grid cards, very, very basic. But then uh, soon enough, we started to see uh, some, uh, some other type of devices, uh, all, kind of, uh, all kind of tokens, um, one button tokens and, uh, and keypad tokens, connected tokens and unconnected tokens and uh, display cards as well. And we saw as well um, uh, readers, also connected and unconnected, that uh, were, were, uh, uh, were used so that we could uh, leverage the banking cards themselves with, uh, with a specific uh, OTP uh, applications as a, as a token, as a possession token. No? So uh, that, was, that was the first, and, and the logic that was behind all that were so these, these devices were being produced, they were manufactured uh, on demand of, a, of, an, of, an, uh, of an issuer, of a, of, a, uh, of a service provider, of a financial institution. Uh, they were getting uh, a key injected during that production, 
And that key uh, uh, was at the same time for all the devices that were being produced was being uh, provisioned into uh, an authentication server. And so whenever there was a the time for an authentication, the user was taking an, OT an OTP, one, one code uh, derived from that uh, particular key that was matched on the back end that could repeat the calculation through a symmetric uh, algorithm that was used. Uh, that was OATH, so we had here one, one technology that has been a technology uh, that has been prevalent for uh, the last 30 years. We have been using OATH across the, across the industry, and it all started basically with, uh, with, this type of, uh, with this type of devices. So if we look at it uh, from the perspective of, uh, of how it changed on the user experience, uh, well, um, uh, certainly the introduction of these devices that were tamper-proof uh, tamper devices, unconnected devices, dedicated devices for one particular service, that brought an increase in security, and obviously it was a second factor, so the increase on security compared to the previous uh, situation that we had uh, was huge. Um, however, it came at, uh, at a cost. We certainly, by introducing this device, um, we degraded significantly the, the user experience because on one side we were forcing the user to, to have to carry, to have to maintain this dedicated device, um, they had to introduce one additional value that they needed to strap from that device. And not only that, I mean, it was also the, the user experience was great also in another way. I mean, if, uh, if or when, and we heard some, some examples of that in some sessions yesterday, um, you would be losing that device, then you had to request some kind of a replacement and you could find yourself limited in doing your, uh, your, uh, your transactions until you would get in that device. Not only that, from the perspective of the financial institutions, these were costly solutions, and also they were a nightmare from the perspective of the management of the logistics of the distribution of, of the devices. So it came at a price. We managed to increase the security, but we certainly degraded the user experience, and we introduced an element of cost which was quite significant. Which is why um, the, uh, the, the industry as a whole uh, was eager to, uh, to find alternatives to this, uh, to this solution. Well, um, around the year 2000, 2001, 2002, there was something that had happened in parallel that enabled the possibility of having an alternative, an alternative to this. And that comes from the fact that uh, around that time, we had reached globally around the world, in many countries, particularly in developed countries, we had reached a very high level of penetration for mobile devices. Uh, we were at 90 plus percent, uh, approaching 100 percent penetration for mobile devices. So all of a sudden, it became very appealing and very attractive to rely on the mobile device that people were carrying as an authentication device. And so um, what we got was um, uh, the introduction of uh, SMS OTP. SMS OTP appeared, and it was accepted by the industry as a, as a solution um, that certainly compared to, to hardware authenticators was, um, was uh, reducing uh, the level of uh, security, as we have discussed in many sessions here. Um, but uh, it was uh, attractive uh, from the perspective of cost reduction, from the perspective of getting out of those uh, logistic nightmares, and also from the perspective of the user experience because all of a sudden we were not requiring for the user to carry a dedicated, uh, a dedicated device. Okay, so um, the next, with, with that combination of, of hardware devices and uh, SMS OTP, we went through most of the 2000s. No? And until we reach another very significant uh, milestone, uh, technological, that came in 2009. Uh, what happened in 2009 was that iPhone was launched. iPhone became the first smartphone, and be uh, behind the uh, iPhone, we got all the, the, other, the other phones. So we switched very quickly from uh, feature phones to, um, to smartphones. No? And, um, and when that happened, uh, very quickly what we started to see were the first uh, mobile applications, authenticator applications, uh, so, or how we call them as well, soft tokens, 
um, that came out and became also an alternative to the usage of SMS uh, OTP. Uh, dedicated applications specifically for authentication. That was the first, uh, the first uh, iteration. Shortly after that happened, we had another, uh, as a consequence of all that, in, uh, in just a matter of one or two years, um, we, we had a, a significant milestone. So all this time, as we have seen, the access device to our digital banking services continued to be uh, the computer, the laptop, through a browser. No? But uh, with the arrival of these smartphones and the applications, um, at our next milestone is that the, the, the phone, the smartphone, doubled up uh, as, on one side, an authenticator for access from a computer or, or, a, or a laptop. Um, but also, we got the introduction of what we call mobile banking, um, because we started to see the applications being issued by, in this case, by financial institutions, uh, in order to access and to perform your, your, uh, your operations or your activity, your online activity with. And this was also very, uh, very significant. So at this particular moment of time, um, the very first services that we saw coming out uh, were services that, again, uh, it's, uh, when, when, you, when you get the introduction, and this was driven by, by demand, and, uh, and you have these first services coming out, and uh, the level of security that the platform was capable of offering, or the level of maturity that we had on this platform was uh, much lower than the one that we had on, uh, on computers. Um, so, first services that we could see coming out were based on uh, a very basic level of uh, a very basic level of security. Sometimes not even protected by by a full password because it was not convenient with the type of uh, of uh, keypads. Sometimes protected by, by a four uh, four digit pin. Obviously, something that was not sustainable. And um, what we rapidly saw was the combination of the authenticator type of application with the mobile banking services uh, thanks to the uh, thanks to um, the apparition of uh, software development kits dedicated to authentication that issuers were able to integrate into their mobile banking applications and that provided the capabilities of the soft token not only the capabilities of the soft token but even further than that because with the introduction of uh, these SDKs, there was, in the mobile device, there was no longer the need for the user to have to type uh, the OTP. So basically, he would introduce their first factor of authentication that still was, at this point, a knowledge factor. And then, uh, upon, uh, upon validation of that first factor, the application could be triggering the SDK and requesting it to generate an OTP, and that OTP could be transmitted online to the backend server for authentication in a way that was transparent for the end user. And to use terminology that we have heard time and time again this, uh, this morning, um, this was the first point where we were having a non-fishable, uh, a, uh, a strong authentication implementation. So uh, the next uh, milestone or the next change that we had here comes again from another technological evolution. It was in uh, 2013, um, with the appearance of the iPhone 5S, it was the introduction of Touch ID, and it was the introduction of, um, of uh, biometrics. So up until now, we had been working with this combination of, uh, of uh, authentication factor. It was all about knowledge and possession. But with the introduction of biometrics on mobile, all of a sudden, we had our third uh, factor, which was inherence, biometrics. And very rapidly and very quickly, it became clear um, that um, the combination of uh, the, the, the widespread combination of factors for a strong authentication on mobile uh, was the combination of possession and inherence. That's what we have uh, come, to, come to live. And so with the, with the replacement of the usage of uh, knowledge factor um, switching into, into biometrics, with the fact that we were no longer in a, in, a, um, uh, in a fishable situation because the possession factor was being uh, transferred automatically by the SDK to the backend without intervention of the end user, we reached at this point with this form of in-band authentication on mobile um, uh, 
a pretty good level of security and a pretty good level of user experience. Um, this was, 2013 was with the introduction of uh, fingerprint biometrics. Then in 2017, if I'm not wrong, uh, was when we got the introduction of facial, uh, facial biometrics. Um, and so this consolidated pretty quickly as the, um, as the main, uh, as the gold standard if you want for a strong authentication on, uh, on mobile. Arrived to this point where we felt, um, I would say with a pretty good level of both, uh, of both metrics, both security and, and user experience, it was only logical to try to leverage um, all what we had achieved on the mobile platform um, to, um, uh, to take advantage of it for securing other, the, all the other channels, and in particular, the computer channel. And so that's why we started to, we started to use, we, um, we, um, uh, we leveraged the mobile as the authenticator using, uh, using out-of-band uh, OTP, so the user experience being you go to the browser, you present your username, you present the password as, a, as, a, as a, the knowledge factor, and you get a push notification which is driven towards your mobile where you can get, uh, you can leverage on what had been already implemented on the mobile app of the bank uh, in order to have that uh, authentication with a user experience which is purely presenting, presenting biometrics. A little bit more of friction than in the case of mobile banking because you still have to make that transfer of context from the, from the PC to the, or from the, uh, from the laptop uh, to the mobile, but it's still uh, a pretty good level of user experience and a pretty good level of, uh, of security. So with all that, we, we came all the way from 1990 to pretty much um, uh, 2017, 18, towards, 20, towards 2020. So if we try to summarize all this um, in, a, in a graph that is showing us on one axis the user experience and the other, uh, on the other axis security, what we can see is that the starting from the username and password, uh, we first realized that we needed to reinforce the security and we accepted that um, we had to um, uh, degrade somehow the user experience in order to achieve the reduction of fraud that was the priority at that particular point of time. From that point on, obviously, the, the, the priority turned into improving the user experience, and that's where what we, how we moved towards uh, the usage of first SMS OTP and then the usage of uh, soft tokens. Uh, we got to a point where we were able to introduce a second channel for doing our digital banking with the arrival of the mobile, uh, obviously with a very low level of security at the beginning that we had to raise up very quickly, but we had the support, the technological support, in order, to, in order to do so. And we got to the experience of in-band strong authentication, non-fishable, on mobile. And on the other side, we leveraged that, uh, that capacity on mobile in order to secure as well um, uh, the access from any other type of device, in particular from a browser on a PC, um, through, um, uh, through out-of-band uh, authentication. So hopefully this was not so painful and it was a quick pass to what has been the history. The one thing that is important to understand, uh, to understand or to, to insist on is that uh, on one side, all this happened uh, through the course of almost 30 years, um, driven by some very specific technological milestones um, like the introduction of the, uh, of the smartphone or the uh, introduction of uh, biometrics on the smartphones that, that help with these big leaps driven by technology. And that it all happened, um, uh, the constant around these 30 years was that the dominance was of this standard of OATH. Uh, along, along the time, what we have been using in the industry uh, quite regularly had been this uh, OATH technology. That's what drove us where, where we are uh, today. The other thing to reflect is that some of these changes that I have been talking about happened uh, over the decade of 2010 to 2020. FIDO Alliance was on starting in 2013. So some of these things were happening while uh, in the background still silently something was going on um, that, is, uh, that is the key for the changes that will drive the next, uh, the next decade. 
So, arrive to this point, what's next? Well, um, once again, if the decade of the 2000s was marked by one access channel, which was the computer, and uh, some hardware devices as authenticators, and the decade of the 2010 was marked by the introduction of the mobile, both as a new channel for access to digital banking services, as well as, a, as an authenticator that became the authenticator of, of choice. Well, it seems that the decade of the 2020s is probably going to be marked by FIDO technology and is going to be marked by another type of situation where whether than having one single reference authenticator uh, for the access through different channels, um, we are going to be going towards a situation where pretty much every access device that we will want to use uh, will incorporate or will be capable of incorporating an authenticator so that we will be able to do in-band authentication from every single device. So, so what, uh, what, uh, what will that, uh, that mean? So we had said before that uh, with the OATH technology we have arrived to, uh, to a point where the best user experience, the best security that we were capable of providing was in-band authentication, non-fishable, on mobile, and out-of-band uh, authentication on a computer. Well, it is important to signal that with FIDO technology, we can start by providing the same standard, the same type of user experience for end users, meaning in-band authentication from a mobile app, as it's being deployed today uh, through OATH, and out-of-band authentication through a mobile, that it could be done as well through push notifications, but it can be done as well. In a way, the QR code uh, solution, it's, an, it's a different means. You are, doing, you are doing a change of context, you are doing an out-of-band, not, uh, uh, not through a push, but through capture on a, through the camera of the device. But it's in the end the same thing, it's out-of-band authentication. Now, the, uh, it's, that's a good thing because uh, it, it, it gives us the opportunity to lead a smooth transition from one technology to the other because we can respect the type of user experience. It, it doesn't have to be necessarily something very, very traumatic. And beyond that, FIDO, what is going to offer us is the possibility to go even further with platform authenticators, web often, uh, the, the type of experiences that we have been talking about. So with that, and coming into what the hints or what history maybe tell us about uh, how, where, where we could be going, we think that um, the, for many financial institutions that have all these legacy forms of authentication in place, um, uh, the migration towards, fi we, we think that, first of all, if you, if you think about it, all the financial, uh, all financial institutions today, or pretty much all financial institutions have a strong, uh, strong customer authentication solution in place. And, uh, and all of them, uh, or pretty much all of them, have that solution based on OATH technology. So if we agree that we are going to see a migration towards FIDO technology, all these, all, all these financial institutions are going to have to uh, handle um, a migration, a, a significant project of uh, migration of technology from OATH to FIDO. The fact that you can have as a starting point this user experience that you can replicate on one technology or the other can, be, uh, can provide a path for a smooth transition. No? Um, it is clear based on what we have been seeing today and particularly for financial institutions that there are some aspects that are not going to be uh, easy to adopt uh, in, a first, uh, in a first moment for financial institutions. No? Uh, there will be questions, there are doubts, and uh, dust is going to take maybe a little bit of time to settle. But uh, irrespective of that, what is clear is that FIDO is the future. And with FIDO being the future, um, financial institutions can take right away the step of uh, of making that transition based on the user experience that, there are, uh, that, that they know today. 
And so from them, at the, on a second step, when dust settles, when things uh, become clear, when everything is clear with respect to compliance to regulations, for example, um, they can make the second step being already settled on FIDO technology towards the usage of platform authenticators. And that's something that different uh, financial institutions will do at different, uh, at different pace, at different speeds. Okay, so uh, last thing, as a, as a recap. Um, first of all, um, a, a strong customer authentication has always been around uh, a long history, um, a, a matter of balance between user experience and security, or it was uh, until a certain point. For many years, it was kind of a compromise. We got to a point where technology with the smartphones allowed us to progress on both angles at the same time. Um, but in any case, overall, we have been ma managing a lot of progress with the progress of technology uh, in, both, in both axes. Uh, number two, uh, we foresee what is going to be a massive transition from OATH technology towards FIDO over the coming, over the coming years. OATH is the technology that uh, financial institutions are using today, and uh, FIDO and PASCIS is the technology that they will be using in the future. Uh, it's inevitable. We think that it's inevitable seeing what we have seen, seeing the level of commitment, the availability on, on platforms. Um, uh, this transition will have to happen. And, um, well, it's a matter to ensuring that financial institutions can do that transition in a smooth way. Uh, we on our side, from Thales and other companies, I'm sure that they are ready to, uh, to help them do that transition. And um, finally, uh, PASCIS. They deliver clearly a great UX. They raise today still certain concerns related, as I was saying, around compliance, around uh, control of those, uh, of those keys. Uh, certainly, that will have to settle, but we think that the user experience, uh, users are going to love the user experience, that users will be adopting services that bet directly on this technology, as is the case of PayPal. Users will be exposed to the, to the user experience. They will love it, and they will be pushing and uh, generating uh, pressure on service providers in general and FIs uh, to adopt them. Um, so, so financial institutions will want to adopt the technology. They will have to find uh, solutions that allow them to uh, make that transition in a way that they feel comfortable with. Last thing, beyond FIDO, uh, we think that it's the combination of SCA with risk-based authentication that's what can eventually take us even further in that continuous path towards better user experience and uh, better security overall. That's all on my side. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pedro. Did we have any question? We have time for maybe one question, if anyone had any. Oh, that, that was a fantastic presentation, and your slides are beautiful. So thank you very much.